Today we're going to talk about the community institution of jails. Uh, remember, in early England, the jails were administered by the shire, or what we would call the sheriff now. Uh, and remember, jails in, at that time in England was spelled G-A-O-L-S. Uh, jails have been in existence much longer than prisons. Uh, that's an important fact to remember. Uh, the, the jails date back to uh, even biblical times. Uh, as we mentioned once before, that there are like 172 passages in the Bible that mention jails. Uh, the, the jails have always served the purpose of holding prisoners for trial or were holding prisoners for a variety of reasons, including sentenced. But today, jails have uh, a more diverse mission. There are a lot more things that uh, where, where people hold people in, in, in the jail. Obviously, people who have been arrested and are waiting trial, people who have been sentenced to short periods of time in jail, a municipal facility or a county facility, often people get 30 to 60 days, 30, 90, even 90 days in jail. Uh, so they're, they're sentenced to serve those in jails. Uh, but they also serve an, uh, other missions. I mean, even uh, people who uh, have been found on the street so intoxicated that they can't take care of themselves, uh, they will sit in the jail until such time as they've sobered up. Uh, traffic offenders, people who haven't paid their fines, lots of reasons, even, even to the fact where sometimes people are held in the jail uh, as homeless or, or mentally deficient uh, to, till, until such time as they can be get, get they have uh, been def referred to some type of uh, s public service organization. Uh, they they have this really multifaceted, but they, they serve a really critical role for the community. It gives a, the the community a place to put people who are are, are not only criminals but people who need some place to stay for short periods of time. Um, so they serve a vital role to the community. Uh, there are lots of different types of jails. Uh, the, 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 if, you, if you think back to the Shire Reeve, uh, in most counties in the United States, there is a county jail. And the county jail is normally uh, run by the sheriff's office. And oftentimes, like in Johnson County, where I worked at one time, uh, the sheriff and his family live above the jail. And the, the, the sheriff and his family, like his wife did, did the cooking for the inmates, and uh, they, she, did, she did cleaning in the, in the facility when, uh, at, when it was necessary. Uh, and, and the sheriff uh, would, would be uh, actually living in the facility. Uh, there are detention centers that are separate for juveniles and some adults and especially women uh, and even even uh, the American Indian tribes have their own jails uh, because they're in kind of an unusual legal status in the fact that they they're not a state federal or municipal facility they are actually maintained run and Prisoners are put in there by actually uh, Native American police. That, the, and we'll talk about later about the fact that many Indian tribes have their own courts. Uh, they, the most common uh, localities for uh, jails is a municipality, uh, a county seat where the sheriff would maintain the jail, and then sometimes many jurisdictions go together and they have a regional detention facility. Uh, there are facilities for men, women, juveniles, and even non-offenders. Remember I talked about the fact that uh, sometimes homeless or the men mentally ill sometimes have to be housed. Uh, today the jails are much safer and much more secure because of the implementation of technology. Uh, many, many years ago there was no cameras and no computers and no electric locks. All of these things have made jails much safer to than they have been in the past. This is a picture of the St. Louis County Justice Facility. Now, this building houses the courts for St. Louis County, but it also has uh, the county jail. Now, county jail 
often holds prisoners who have been sentenced for longer times. Remember I said in Hazelwood, the, the, in the municipal jail, uh, it was not uncommon for uh, the judge to sentence someone to uh, 30, 60, 90 days. But at, at, with the county justice facility, uh, there are, there are uh, uh, a lot of inmates that, that are being held for not only the count, St. Louis County Police, but also for a lot of municipal jurisdictions that don't have uh, their own jail. Inmates in the general population of the county jail are housed on the fl floors four through seven. So that's four through seven of the Justice Center. There are four housing units on each floor with 48 cells in each pod. One third of the cells are double bunked for a total capacity of 64 inmates per pod and 256 inmates per floor for a total of 1,020. The county jail has a mission statement that is similar to the new type of jails. It's, they're, they're trying to institute something where the jail is not just a holding facility, but it performs a lot of other functions. This is the mission statement of the St. Louis County Jail. It also talks about the fact that the St. Louis County Jail wants to institute a professional correctional staff. We'll talk about correctional officers and professional status later, but this is the type of mission statement that that many of the new type of jails is going to follow where they're not only interested in uh incapacitation but they're uh, and on our retribution but they're also involved in rehabilitation and and also reintegration jails operate on uh, 24 hour a day, seven day a week, 365 day a year uh, basis. There has to be uh, someone there or someone monitoring the prisoners at all times. The, and the clientele varies. And the clientele is, like I said before, is gonna be people who have been uh, arrested and waiting trial, people who have been uh, found guilty and are waiting sentencing. They also have people who have been sentenced to short periods of confinement and in some of the larger facilities, even a, a more extended period of time. Uh, they also have uh, people, we're gonna talk about uh, how, how many people are in jails that have uh, mental illness and how many of them uh, have, are, are in a homeless. The, the process for anyone coming into a jail is pretty much routine stuff. First, the, the, whoever's being brought in is brought in by the police officer, the de sheriff's deputy, uh, or law enforcement officer, and, and then they go through a booking process. Now, with non-offenders, it's much less complicated for offenders. Either there is photographing and fingerprinting, and uh, they have to fill out a very detailed medical detention form uh, but it, it, in the booking process they take photographs and fingerprints and they uh, basically process them through in a routine way and then based on the information that they get uh, the the prisoner is classified uh, as dangerous or suicidal risk or uh, many things much like when someone comes into a prison only much not nearly as um, detailed as when someone is admitted to a prison. We'll talk about classification of inmates in prisons when, in, a, in a later chapter, but for the most part, when a prisoner comes into the jail, they're classified. And it's important that there be no mistakes. Uh, there's, there was an incident oh, almost 20 years ago uh, in the St. Charles County Jail when uh, a prisoner was brought in and uh, the information on him was a little bit sketchy, uh, but he was brought in for uh, attempting to molest uh, uh, two little girls. Well, little did they know that he was also a serial sex offender who had uh, sodomized a bunch of, hit, uh, at different times, hitchhikers that were male. And they put in uh, this young 18-year-old kid 
that had not paid his ticket in the same cell with him. Uh, and uh, what, what actually happened was that the uh, sex offender sexually molested this 18-year-old kid who hadn't paid his traffic ticket, and then he hung him in his cell. That's, that's how serious this classification system is. When someone comes into a jail, it's important that they find out who they are and what type of risk level they are. Uh, and then prisoners are, are placed uh, in the cell and, and often are then transferred to uh, more permanent housing uh, it's not uncommon for our municipal jurisdictions for someone who is going to have to be confined for a longer period of time be transferred to the county jail. Overcrowding exists in both prisons and in jails. That, and and it, it's, a, it's a little bit confusing sometimes about, uh, about overcrowding. Overcrowding is a phenomenon that occurs when the number of inmates exceeds the physical capacity, beds, and space available. But in jails, and un not unlike prisons, there are different cells designated for juveniles and women and, uh, and, and, uh, and so the overcrowding may uh, occur in such a way that all of the cells designated for male prisoners could be full, and then uh, the, there could be a, like a, some number of women's cells that are not occupied. And for the most part, uh, adults are never put into uh, the juvenile part of, of a facility. So the idea of capacity is kind of uh, arbitrary because to give you some idea, I ask a captain with the Hazelwood Police Department, who is a friend, if they would simply go back and take a picture of uh, the booking area and one of the cells uh, so that I could use it in my slideshow. And uh, he, he, he emailed me back that he couldn't do it at the time because the, 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 <laughs> the jail was full and it had reached its capacity. When, when you get to a point too where you start to get um, too many prisoners and you, have, you continue to have prisoners come in, you begin to establish some type of triage type system where prisoners who are being held on lesser offenses are, are released on their own recognizance uh, so that you can hold prisoners that have committed more serious offenses. I, as, as I mentioned, it, it, capacity is kind of misleading because different parts of this jail have different purposes and, and it, the overcrowding kind of limits the mission uh, of the law enforcement agency uh, and the court system uh, because it, it, it's supposed to be there so that you can put people in there and keep them until they are appropriate released. If you have overcrowding, it, it really creates a situation where uh, it, the, the mission is not being fulfilled. So, and, and, and the jail is then loss of effectiveness. Sometimes prisoners are double bunked when, when they shouldn't be. Sometimes uh, the, the, the jail is more full than you can, than you can take care of and, or that you have enough correctional people to take care of. And in, in, in many jurisdictions, when you have like a high crime rate area in a specific neighborhood, you have a tendency to put a lot of officers in there and you have a zero tolerance policy. Well, if your jail's full, you can't arrest those people with the zero tolerance policy because you can't, you have no place to put them. Uh, it, a lot of times, uh, the zero tolerance policy is to arrest everyone in a specific area uh, to address uh, quality of life issues. Uh, when you have a, a, a dope house, uh, a lot of times uh, people coming and going 
in, into the dope house. You don't have the opportunity to just stop and search anyone. You then look for minor offenses where you can arrest someone to find out if they have drugs on them, things like that. The overcrowding is one of the reasons that there have been so many successful lawsuits. Uh, because when, when I said, when I, as I pointed out before, one of the things is that uh, you don't have enough correctional people to properly monitor uh, the cells and the prisoner activities. Uh, imagine the, the lawsuit that was filed against the St. Louis County Police Department where the, uh, the kid who was, didn't pay his traffic tickets was killed. It's a documented fact that most inmates are minority males. Uh, and, and women are a very small percentage of jail populations. And because of that, a lot of the policies uh, are directed towards males and the largest number of cells available in jails are dedicated for men. One of the reasons that are, is traditionally uh, pointed out at, as to why there are such a, a high disparity of minority males in jails, is, it goes back to the Nixon administration when they passed, uh, the, they, they started the policy of the war on drugs and there were several pieces of legislation that were created that seemed to designate uh, a, a target of uh, under underprivileged communities which were predominantly uh, African American or Hispanic uh, and and so uh, even even to the fact that there was a big difference in the fact that the laws targeted crack cocaine as opposed to powdered cocaine which was more prevalent in uh, the uh, upper class and white communities uh, so the, the war on drugs is one of those things that's always credited for the difference in, in, in the disparity of uh, who's incarcerated in the United States. And nobody really can define why, but in, in recent years there's been a decline of women and minorities. Part of that could be attributed to the fact that, that uh, there's been some legislation that uh, equalized the mandatory uh, sentencing for like crack cocaine as opposed to powder cocaine. We're going to talk about that at a later time, but, but, but it could also simply be uh, a trend of their uh, uh, police are not targeting minorities or women specifically uh, uh, that, that maybe were in the past. mentally ill are more likely to be homeless and so consequently they're more likely to be seen by police or contacted by police on the street uh, so there, there's there's more likely uh, uh, going to be some type of uh, conflict between uh, the police or the public and the mentally ill so they are often uh, someone who comes to the police attention and winds up being incarcerated. Uh, James and Glaze in 2006 found that 61% of jail inmates, 75% women, 63% men, were, in, were incarcerated and had some type of mental illness. And they found that only 56% of state prisoners, state prisoners uh, had some type of mental illness, and that 45% of federal prisons inmates had some type of mental illness. So the the, the key point here is uh, more jail inmates than state or federal prisons uh, are are likely to have some type of mental illness. Beck, Rosowski, Casper, and Krebs in 2013, did a national 
did a national inmate survey for the Bureau of Justice Statistics, and it found that 26% of inmates have serious psychological distress or mental illness. Mental illness, and, and there's a high degree of sexual victimization of those people with mental illness. Medical problems are a problematic social issue. Uh, the Bureau of Justice Statistics between 2011 and 2012 uh, conducted a survey of both in, inmates in jails and prisons, and, and they found out that uh, elderly inmates were much more likely to report uh, medical type problems, and that only stands to reason because as people get older, they develop more m medical problems than the younger people. Uh, they also found that uh, female inmates were more likely than men to report some type of medical problem and that obviously uh, juveniles who you would think would report very very few uh, medical problems. It was determined that many of their uh, medical problems had to do with uh, communicable sexual, uh, pro communicable sexual uh, diseases. Uh, <laughs> The youth also have their own set of problems, and it has to do with legally getting treatment. Uh, a lot of times, youthful offenders' parents are not around to give permission for medical treatment, uh, and that sometimes even a court order is required from the juvenile court so that a, ch so that a youthful offender can receive some type of medical uh, treatment. A uh, U.S. Supreme Court decision in 1977 in Estelle versus Gamble, uh, inmates have a constitutional right to medical care. Uh, if the, the Eighth Amendment prohibition against cruel and unusual punishment uh, was, was, was used to say that, uh, was used to rule that uh, inmates have a constitutional right to medic, medical treatment and uh, deliberately in different correctional facilities would be civilly liable. Jails need budgetary coverage for medical issues of inmates. Uh, and and like the one I was most familiar with, the Hazelwood Jail, uh, we had to provide medications for those prisoners who required certain medications, and there was uh, a, a specific line item in uh, the annual budget regarding inmate medication and treatment. And uh, in, in Hazelwood, we generally would take uh, an inmate that needed treatment to the closest medical facility and get them treated there. Uh, however, uh, some, some jails uh, contract with a doctor or uh, some, some uh, tr clinic uh, to provide treatment for prisoners with medical problems. The medical care is important for a number of reasons. First of all, there are a lot of lawsuits for non-treatment, and like I said before, for deliberate indifference, uh, that they then that have cost uh, government agencies a lot of money, and it it really is the right thing to do. Uh, you if someone has a medical condition, uh, they need to be treated, uh, and if you can get the inmate treated, uh, like say. Uh, for some type of communicable disease that when they are released back out into the community or society uh, that, that that illness would not be spread to other people. Uh, before I said that the, the Hazelwood Municipal, I asked the captain for the Hazelwood Municipal Jail to uh, send me pictures of what the municipal jail looked like 
and he couldn't because of the overcrowding. Well, shortly thereafter, he did send me a picture. Now, that's what uh, the, one of the cells looks like. That's one of the male cells in Hazelwood. And you'll see there's not much there. There's a bunk and a toilet, and there, you can't see it in this picture, but there's also uh, a sink. Uh, and this is the booking area. Uh, people are brought in from what's called a sally port. It's basically a gr secured garage. And you come in to this facility, and you come in, uh, and they would be booked, photographed, fingerprinted, classified. Uh, all of the paperwork would be entered into the computer uh, system. Uh, and then they would be placed in a cell awaiting whatever whatever the next step in their Substance abuse and jails. It's pretty commonly known that many people who come into jails uh, are not only under the influence or have been under the influence of some type of drug uh, prior to uh, their incarceration. It's a social reality. It's a part of uh, our social reality that uh, that uh, a drug abuse uh, is 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 prevalent uh, in today's society. Uh, the Bureau of Justice Statistics uh, did a study in 2002 and found that half of convicted inmates reported being under the influence of uh, drugs at the time of commission of their offense. Drugs of choice: the most common drug that affects people who have been brought into the jail is alcohol. Uh, there, after alcohol, it really becomes kind of a diverse situation where uh, there's often uh, cocaine uh, and, and marijuana and hallucinogenics. And uh, we've, we've had to incarcerate in Hazelwood uh, lots of times people who uh, are under the influence of meth, uh, I mean, it, it, there are there are all kinds of hallucinogenics that lead people to do commit acts that cause them to be incarcerated. And so it really varies after alcohol. But remember, alcohol is the most common one. Uh, of those people who have been incarcerated, most have been uh, in a in a prior treatment program before uh, they before uh, they were arrested. Sixty three percent. There are program issues in, in the jail for getting these people treatment uh, because the jail, you're only in a jail for a short period of time. A lot of times just awaiting trial or just awaiting sentencing. So there, there's no way to get any type of rehabilitative uh, help for these people. Uh, and because of the presumption of innocence, when someone is brought in awaiting trial, they've been arrested and awaiting trial, uh, there's no way that you can force anyone uh, into uh, some treatment. Suicides are most people who enter the jail and attempt to commit suicide are uh, under the influence of alcohol. Uh, they're intoxicated. They think it's the lowest point in their life. And uh, they wind up thinking they have no other alternative than to commit suicide. Most of the people who commit suicide or attempt to commit suicide uh, in a jail are were incarcerated for the first time. And they can, and it, it, like I said, it, it, they feel like it's the lowest time in their life. They're at, their, at the bottom. And... The combination of conditions can predispose to a suicide or attempt suicide. The National Center on Institutions and Alternatives did studies in 1986 and 2006, and they found that of those people who uh, committed suicide, 97, uh, I'm sorry, 67% were white, 93% were male, and 42% were single or divorced. The average age was 35, 43% held on a personal or violent charge, lots of times domestic violence. 47% had a history of substance abuse, 28% had some type of medical problem, 38% had a history of mental illness, and 20% had a history of 
psychotropic medications, uh, like psych psychotropic medications are like uh, Valium or Elevil or uh, some type of mood enhancing drug. 35% had a history of suicide attempts and, and there was no seasonal pattern. I found that odd too because I always felt like when we had more suicide attempts in the jail in Hazelwood, it was always around some type of holiday. And 32% occurred between 3.01 p.m. and 9 p.m. in the afternoon. Very common for people to come in intoxicated also during those periods of time. 23% did did, committed suicide during the first 24 hours. 27% committed the, the act between 2 and 14 days, and 20%, uh, it was between 1 and 4 months. Melinda Winter in 2003 reported that a study of 10 years of suicide data from jails in one Midwestern city, uh, I'm sorry, Midwestern state, and by the way, I could not figure out which state she had done her study in. Uh, younger people who are arrested for a violent fel felony who had no history of mental uh, or physical disorder did not exhibit tendencies at, but were intoxicated. Tartaro and Ruddle in 2006 did a study of suicides in jails and two to five times more suicides were in smaller facilities, less than 100. And, and that, make, that kind of makes sense because of the fact that the larger the facility, the more likely it is that uh, they had enough correctional staff to actually see uh, someone attempt suicide and get them down before they actually committed suicide. Selling in 2007 and 2011 did a study of suicides in the New York jail system. There were eight deaths and there were 2,514 self injuries like being attempts where they were not successful. And the, the New York jail system actually admitted 80,000 per year inmates. This is total inmate population admissions and 12,500 daily. That seems like a very small number for uh, that many people incarcerated in the New York system where they only had eight deaths and 2,514 self injury The rates in jail are twice as high as would be true for comparable groups of free citizens. So again, going to jail is one of the precipitating causes of people attempting to commit suicide. The rate is three times that of prison. So it's three times more likely that suicides will occur in jails than in prisons. Uh, jail and prison deaths due to suicide and homicide declined precipitously between 1983 and 2002. Jail suicides accounted for the major cause of death among inmates in 1983. However, by, by 2002, illness replaced suicide as the primary reason for death in prisons and jails. Gangs are a fact of life in both jails and prisons, and they create lots of problems for people who run and operate jails. Violence and other offenses tend to naturally follow in the wake of incarceration of gang members. 
It's more prevalent in large urban areas, although even in smaller areas you are going to find some gang affiliations, especially uh, in regional areas. It's more of a problem in large urban jails because you're more likely to get uh, diverse gang members uh, from, uh, there are all kinds of different gangs in, in prisons and jails. Estimates of the prevalence uh, range from 16 to 25 percent depending on the jail population, jail location. And these are likely to be low estimates. Individuals are not forthcoming about gang membership. However, correctional officers and law enforcement officers are trained to look for gang affiliation uh, techniques. Uh, it simply uh, can be as simple as a rolled up uh, pants leg uh, or uh, the, where you wear your belt on, on, on one side or the other. Uh, but the most prevalent is gang tattoos and you're going to find a lot of identifications of gang members from the gang tattoos. Here's an example of an Aryan Brotherhood uh, tattoo. Mexican Mafia and MS-13 uh, gang members. Jails try to counter collective influence of gangs by keeping them, well, by separating the member and housing units. If you can keep the gang members separated from each other and certainly from other gangs members, uh, you, 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 you are, get a leg up on, on keeping the problems of violence down. However, the truth is it's very difficult to do that in a lot of jails. Only the, the larger facilities are able to do that. They document those involved in the gangs and their activities throughout the system. Ta Tapia in 2014 stu did a study of Latino gangs in Texas and found that there was a, a generational divide in the gangs, even gang members, uh, because of uh, the age. I mean, older gang members are all about preserving uh, the gang and its its criminal activities. What what they they look at the gang as a criminal enterprise. Uh, however, the younger gang members who've been incarcerated basically see it as a form of association and protection. Uh, there's a lot of sexual violence. Uh, in uh, jails and prisons. I mentioned the one earlier about uh, the St. Louis County, St. Charles County Jail. Uh, the Rape Elimination Act of 2013 mandated the collection of data of sexual assaults in prisons and jails. And it identified facilities with higher levels. It, they're supposed to identify higher facilities with higher levels of victimization. And Back in 2013, uh, did a national inmate survey, remember between 2011 and 2012, and found that 3.2% of jail inmates reported experiencing sexual victimization perpetrated by staff and other inmates in the previous 12 months. And when you extrapolated the data, uh, you found that 80,600 victims total nationwide between those years. 25,100 were victims in jails and 11,900 were sexual assaults of inmate on inmate and 13,200 was staff on inmate. Female inmates were more than twice as likely than males to be victimized by other inmates. Males were slightly more likely victims by staff. And the higher victimization rate of those who are two or more races 
and whites were more likely to be victimized by other inmates. Younger inmates and those with college degrees targeted by both staff and inmates and the LGBTI inmates were more likely to be victimized by both staff and inmates. Those with mental illnesses were much more likely to be to experience sexual victimization than those without by all by staff and uh, an inmate. The Prison Rape Elimination Act pres prescribed surveys that needed to be done uh, that was passed in 2014. More than half of substantiated staff on inmate sexual misconduct victimization was committed by female staff on ma male inmates. Females were more likely to be perpetrators in prison and males were more likely to be perpetrators in jails. The Urban Institute in 2011 used situational crime prevention approach to reduce violence and sexual assault. And, and their recommendations were multifaceted. They studied past events and they, 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 they advocated more cameras so that there were less dead spots where these victimizations could occur. They, they also said that what you need is a consistent staff presence so that it was less likely that these victimizations could occur, and hiring better staff by screening in the hiring process. It's part of the professionalization process that uh, is advocated throughout uh, the, the text. And training staff in intervention, violence, mental illness, and, and, and to establish a no tolerance, po tolerance policy uh, for uh, any type of vect sexual victimization. Also, controlling contraband uh, is, is another recommendation by the Institute uh, so that it could not be used to entice, entice uh, victimization. In the, in the 1980s, uh, they developed something called the, the new generation of their popular direct supervision jails. Uh, and it, the new generation jails has two key components, rounded or podular design. They, they have like an open area in the middle. All of the cells are, are, surround, are, are, are basically around this pod. And it, it, it means that in these new generation jails, there's direct supervision of inmates at all times. It would complement supervision and negate the uh, uh, ability of inmates to gain control over the units. Uh, they, the new generation jails uh, basically create the situation where there is a, a communal atmosphere in the area, but they are under direct supervision of correctional officers on a continuous basis so that they can control problems. The other important facets of the, the officer uh, role had to change. Zupan building off of Gettinger's 1984 description of the popular pod, jails uh, said that the officer's role had to change and the seven critical dimensions of the new generation correctional officer were they, they needed to have they needed to be a proactive leader and con and have conflict resolution skills they needed to be uh, sometimes uh, aware and able to mediate any type of uh, problems that that occur in the pod uh, they need to build respectful relationships with the inmates, not to become too, com not to be too uh, complacent or too friendly with them, but to develop a respectful relationship with the inmates. The, the uniform, it had to be uniform and predictable enforcement of all rules. 
uniform and predictable. Active observation of inmates in the unit so that they realized when there was a problem developing. And they had attendance, they had to attend to inmate requests with respect and dignity, not just blow it off to actually deal with it in a respectful and dignified way. And disciplining inmates fairly and consistently. And they needed to be organized and in open, have an open leadership style, leadership supervision style. They needed to be not they, these often sound like uh, parental skills, but basically they need to supervise and deal with problems, especially before they occur, and to deal with the inmates where you could develop a, a relationship that was respectful but dignified. It, these jails became widely popular in the late 1980s through the 1990s and they're still in effect in many jurisdictions today. The architecture can be seen in prisons today. It, it, even the St. Louis County Correctional Facility has this type of popular design. Often represent significant improvement over the old style jails. Widely acknowledged they often represent significant improvement over more traditional jails and if operated correctly and include all the elements can be less costly to run, safer for both staff and inmates, and provide more development and an enriched role for staff, and it also includes more amenities for the inmates. Community jails. It's a promising innovation in jails. Programming on the inside does not end at the jailhouse door. They try to facilitate a seamless transfer into the community. And, and the partnership with the jail and the community to provide these, these, these services is really important. The inmate is part of the community, whether in custody or not. His family's still there, his, his, ch his children. I mean, uh, they are going to be reintegrated into society. and. The development requires resources to, to accommodate community experts. It's really hard to find sometimes experts in the community who can help facilitate these transitions. And jail managers must convince local service providers and lawmakers if need be. Co-equal staffing is a promising innovation in some sheriff's departments. The programs provide comparable pay and benefits to not only deputies, but to correctional workers. And the jails historically have been a dumping ground for people who could not make it in law enforcement. And they would be hired to work <coughs> in the jail. And those deemed not able to make it in, 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 in actual policing were put in, were relegated to work in the correctional facility and oftentimes it made the correctional officers less than professional. Were and often still are paid less, it's true. The, the correctional officers are often paid much lower than police officers or deputy sheriffs. And, and they, they receive less training, especially in municipal organizations there is almost no training. When a correctional officer is hired, it's mostly on-the-job training where one correctional officer teaches another correctional officer what the policies are and what the routine is for being a correctional officer in a, in a municipal jail. I, I, I know that in Hazelwood, uh, our, our correctional officers were paid less than $9 an hour. Uh, and, and although some of them were younger people trying to get into the police academy and to be hired by a police department, a lot of them uh, were, were
terminal correctional officers that we're going to always be just a correctional officer. Difficult to attract and keep the best personnel. It certainly is because the best personnel move on. <laughs> Rethinking about how to keep people out of jail uh, will will it, it, it is is talking about reentry and there's chapter 10 is about reentry and programs the newest thing in jails today as well as in prisons is reintegration transitioning back to the community is 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 an important function remember i said when we read the mission statement for the st louis county uh correctional facility that one of the one of the things that is is uh that they did was institute some type of re there have been some successful reentry programs they identify the inmates problem mental health psychological social skills educational vocational and they find resources to correct the problems with some type of community support well bowman and garland in 2015 Probation and parole can be effective, can save time, and be less costly than incarceration. This video is of the Polk Every day, County, dozens of people Iowa are jail and booked into a, the Polk County Jail. Uh, Last night at 10, News Channel 8's Carrie Gavin to, became one of them. Uh, From the handcuffs to the orange jumpsuit, even the mugshot. Tonight, Carrie continues that process to give us an inside look and bar. incarceration in the Polk County, Iowa the Polk Jail. County jail while uh, the things to look at in this video are, this is a popular design. This is a new generation jail. Think about how when they come in, the booking process, all of those things up through, uh, and, and that's, that's pretty much why so I, I wanted you to see this dark. video. Definitely a different world in here. 1,800 well-worn locks and doors. These are the barriers that separate inmates at the Polk County Jail from the outside world. The cold, identical, minimal interior is home to some 900 inmates at any given time. Each inmate must first go through the booking process, an experience I took part in yesterday. If you're still not uh, able to post bond or if you don't have a bond at that point, then you would be assigned after classification to one of the housing units. Once assigned, the orange jumpsuit is traded in for a new jail uniform, color coded to let everyone know where you should be. The orange and white and the green and white are just general population. The pink is the um, inmates who would be in the high security or maximum security area. And they would be our inmates that we need to be the most cautious around. And then our inmate workers wear yellow and green. There are several housing units or pods at the jail. This is the maximum security unit. One of the differences is the amount of people that would be assigned to this unit. There would only be up to 32 people and they would all be assigned to an individual cell. In our other housing units, you can have up to 64 people. For our safety and theirs, we do not go into a housing unit with inmates, but this unit is similar to the others. It's more of an open housing unit. Uh, there generally aren't doors on the cells and uh, there would be at least two people assigned there. Each housing unit has two tiers with tables in the center, telephones, and visitation units. Calls are limited to 20 minutes and must be paid for by the inmates. Two 20-minute video visitations are allowed per week. Inside each cell, a bed, a desk, and a toilet with wash basin. These are the indelicate aspects of life in jail as there is no privacy. We don't have too many problems here at the jail. Um, most people do learn to get along. One detention officer is assigned to watch over each housing unit, two in the maximum security area. During the day, inmates follow a regimented schedule and routine. Generally, you start showers in the morning. Breakfast time is around 6, 6.30. Lunch time is around 11, 11.30. Now we have another shift change a few hours after that. And then uh, supper time is about 6 or 6.30. The lights would get shut off uh, about 10 or 10.30 at night 
and um, and that would include all the lights in, the, in this housing unit. 330 cameras and 3,000 intercoms keep watch over the jail at all times. A central control center just outside each housing unit keeps even closer surveillance. For every inmate, the expectations and rules are the same. There is no special treatment here. You see a uh, the full range of uh, societal status that, that comes in here and so people make mistakes and sometimes they make ones and get caught and end up in jail and, and it could definitely happen to anybody. Like I said earlier, my time in jail was short. I wasn't convicted of any crime. And one thing I really realized during my time there is that the officers working there certainly realize that inmates come from all walks of life and they do treat them with respect. But Sergeant Ricker says that respect has to be earned by both the inmates and the officers. And as you saw there, there are definitely a lot of rules in jail. And to make sure all the inmates understand what is expected of them, they get this 40 page jail rule handbook after they're booked. It outlines everything that they can do, what they are expected to do, and of course, what not to do. If you want to check it out, we've put a link on our website so you can know all the rules of the Polk County Jail. But they're very businesslike there, aren't they? Very I mean, businesslike. Very you know, in a lot of respect. I saw a lot of respect by both the inmates and the officers. All right, Carrie, thanks.